Welcome to Bobby Osinski's Inner Circle. I'm Bobby Osinski, and this is a show all about music, music production, and the music business. My guest this week is Anthony Martini, a new partner in the online royalty marketplace, Royalty Exchange. First of all, there's a really disturbing survey that came out this last week. 64% of UK musicians are considering leaving the business. This was done by the music booking platform Encore Musicians, and it found out that there's a lot of people that are hurt badly by the pandemic. Yeah, we know that because it's the case here, too. But I don't hear about musicians that are packing it in so much in the United States. In the UK, however, it looks like they have to. Now, the interesting thing here is that there's a lot more government assistance available in the UK, and smaller shows are actually allowed. So it seems like there's a lot more leeway for musicians there. That being said, musicians in the UK lost an average of 87% of live bookings. 50% have no bookings till the end of the year, while last year, in comparison, they had 27 lined up. 40% have applied for a non-music job. 41% get government aid, and 42% get some sort of non-government support. It seems that women artists and musicians are being hurt the most. This is women between the ages of 25 and 34, and their income is down 90% from last year. And men have 24% more gigs booked from now until the end of the year. All in all, on average, UK musicians have lost the equivalent of $26,500. So you can figure if those numbers are happening in the UK, it's at least the same here in the US. Not a good sign for the future of the music business. If you have any questions or comments, you can send them to questions at bobbyownercircle.com. Don't forget about my online courses on mixing, production, branding, and music business success at bobbyosinskicourses.com. Also, get an expert analysis and objective opinion of your songs and mixes as a member of my Hitmakers Club. Go to hitmakersclub.com to learn more. Now, speaking of the pandemic, this is kind of scary. It seems that the most at-risk players are horn players and all the players around them. University of Iowa Health did a big study and found out that horn players in general, it didn't matter whether it was K-12, collegiate, orchestras, or on a professional level, they were all at risk, mostly because a horn player has deeper breathing than just about any other musician except for a vocalist. There's forceful exhalation. There's aerosolation of mucus that's coming from the mouth and the nose and even the lungs. And the worst thing is they found that plexiglass shields are ineffective from all of this. You would think that those would work. And yeah, they might work acoustically, but it looks like they're not working when it comes to keeping the virus at bay. It gets even worse though. If you're a reed instrument player, there's no guidelines on how to make them safe. You can't soak them in alcohol. And what makes it even worse, when it comes to high school, for instance, there's a lot of sharing of instruments, which, boy, that's probably the worst when it comes to lack of virus protection. On the other hand, brass instruments are fairly easily cleaned. But apart from saxes, reed instruments are made of delicate woods and felts and corks, so you can't do that. On top of that, less experienced players have more leakage around their amateur, so there's increased nasal transmissions. So you might think, well, we can still do this with pro players because, let's face it, they know how to work this pretty well. But in talking to my fellow producers and engineers out there, that's not the case. What everyone's trying to do is get their horn players to record themselves, but apparently they're not getting the results they want. So the few horn sessions I've heard about have been long and hard when it comes to working in the studio, staying socially distanced, staying safe, and still getting a good sound. When it comes down to it, they're just suggesting wait until this is over and then pick it up there. My guest this week is Anthony Martini, who got his start as a rap metal vocalist before finding his way into other parts of the music business. 
During his management career, he worked with acts such as Lamb of God, Fall Out Boy, Train, and Sia before he discovered the then-unknown rapper Tyga. Anthony then founded the independent record label Commission, where he signed artists like Lil Dicky, Madian TYO, and IDK, who generated billions of streams and chart-topping singles. Along the way, he was named as a Billboard hip-hop power player in 2019. Anthony is now a partner at Royalty Exchange, the online marketplace for buying and selling royalties, where he drives their artist relations and deal-making. During the interview, we talked about getting into management, starting an indie record label, how artists and investors are vetted at Royalty Exchange, a look at the virtual realm of the music business, and much more. I spoke with Anthony via Zoom from his home office in New York. Tell me how you get into the music business. Well, I mean, uh, all the way back in the beginning, I, I got into it uh, on the artist side. I was in bands and kind of was a, a struggling touring musician for uh, most of my, say, you know, late teens into 20s. Um, and, you know, that's sort of during that time, that's when I learned a lot about the business and kind of learned, you know, we were very DIY uh, band and I was sort of like the de facto manager of the band, you know, and, and learned the business that way from the inside out where, you know, I was booking shows and making merch and learning how to, you know, license music to labels and, you know, all that sort of stuff, which gave me a good, I think, foundation uh, to be able to pivot into the business side of things uh, after, you know, after that sort of had its run. And, and so after certain amount of years trying to, to make it, uh, to make it big and be a rock star. And it didn't really, uh, pan out the way that, you know, we would hope I took all, all those experiences and the things that I learned and, and ended up, uh, actually getting into the business side and started managing other acts. And, uh, well, before that, I actually had a sort of a in-between job where I was working at a music distributor and, uh, I was in a warehouse just picking CDs and packing boxes of, of CDs that like, you know, stores would order and, uh, that sucked. It was a minimum wage job and just kind of like in a shitty warehouse in New Jersey. And, you know, but it was, it was a paying gig and it was, you know, I needed money at the time. And so, and it was music. And, but even during that time, I kind of took some lessons from that where I, I started to learn what, um, you know, what labels would use in their marketing sheets and their pitch sheets, the, the one sheets that they would send to distributors to, to get stores to want to take in their music and things like that. So, you know, even that wasn't really wasted time. It was kind of, you know, I gained some experience from that. But then my first, I guess, like real gig in, in, in the music business side of things came when I started working for this uh, independent label called Ferret Records at the time. Uh, and it was like pretty much a heavy metal, like punk, hardcore label. And they were starting up a management division. And so someone I knew in a &R, uh, that I knew ended up going to work there and becoming one of the partners. And, and he knew that I was looking for a job and, you know, he uh, brought me in and sort of started grooming me to, to learn artist management on a, on a more official level. Um, and so, you know, I was at the time I was managing some crazy band, you know, like black metal bands from Poland that are like, you know, like <laughs> they live in the fucking woods and, you know, it's like crazy shit like that. Uh, yeah. You know, I had some some hardcore bands. Uh, I had this metal band, Lamb of God, who's pretty. You know, yeah. now they're one of the biggest you know metal bands out there. But we started working with them when they were pretty much you know brand new. You know, and all all that was again, it was it was great experience. I, I learned a lot, but you know, I wasn't. I've always been a fan of all all genres, um, but I grew up listening to rock, but more hip hop really like i was surrounded by hip hop where i grew up i i come from uh elizabeth new jersey which is you know like an inner city kind of rough area and and you know i just growing up as a kid in in the 90s and and you know into the 2000s like hip hop was king and, and that's sort of every everything i that surrounded me when i was going to school and and all my friends and playing sports that's uh that, that's sort of what my i guess rock and roll ended up being um and uh, I was I was working in this this metal rock label, and then I had an opportunity to move over to this company called Crush Management, who was, you know, they they had a lot more mainstream acts, but they were trying to start an urban division, and so they were like, you know, do you want to come over here and start trying to find 
you know, rappers to work with and, and, and stuff like that. And so it was a, it was an appealing opportunity. Um, I initially turned it down though at first uh, and, and they offered me an act that ended up blowing up and becoming pretty big. But at the time I just wasn't into them. And I was like, ah, no. Nah. And then this, this group goes on to have platinum hits. And I was like, fuck man, I, sh- I should have took that job. But uh, the second time around I ended up going over there and then I, I found this artist named Tyga who, you know, at the time was just a young uh, 16 year old kid from, from LA and he became like my focus and really wanted to develop and build him. And, and you know, that, that in itself is a whole crazy, you know, story and backstory to that. But that, that was, that became my first real, I guess, break in the music business because Tyga, you know, eventually went on to have some huge success and that kind of put me on the map as, as a manager and just doing the artist management thing for all those years it's just, it's a grind, you know, like be, being artist manager is, is definitely, uh, you know, it, it's definitely a grind and, and there's not a lot of, uh, security. There's not a lot of stability. You're kind of always all over the place. You never know like, when your next check is coming in a way. Like it's, 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 it's good because it's a eat what you kill mentality and you kind of like have to go out and create opportunities, which is, is fine. I was, I was comfortable with that. It's just, uh, after so many years of doing it and, and traveling the world and kind of being everywhere and, and having no home life and, and no routine it starts to wear on you. So I started trying to think of different ways to, to, to pivot into other sectors of the business. And I'd always been interested in being at a record label. I always felt like I had a good ear and I was a, I was a good A&R from that sense where I, I was able to pick artists that, I thought would be successful and usually they did become successful. Um, I just never really had a platform and I I ended up, I I met this kid named little Dickie and at the time someone sent me a link to his YouTube video and uh, you know, I thought it was cool. It was interesting. I thought it was different. You know, I just want, you know, I I wanted to meet him. So ended up met with him, had a conversation. And and at that point I knew like, all right, this, this guy is going to be huge. He's got, the eye of the tiger, like he's, you know, he's in it to win it. Like he had a vision, he knew exactly what he wanted to do. And he convinced you, you know what I mean? When he, when you sat down and talked with him on, on the surface, you wouldn't think that he would have such a strong, uh, like star power in a way, because he's just, his brand is sort of being like this normal, you know, every man. Yeah. Um, but when, when he's in a room, you definitely feel that presence. And, and, you know, I, I was convinced from that moment and, uh, you know, initially started managing it, but he, there was a lot of major label interest um, because he was starting to get a, a lot of views on, on YouTube. And I just knew if he signed with a major label at that time, he probably would have never came out. You know, that, like I'd been through that whole process with various artists as a manager, like there's, there's momentum and these labels are excited. Everyone's calling and then they sign you and then, okay, get in the studio, make a hit. Uh, this song's not a hit. This song's not a hit. This uh, uh, keep keep recording. Keep oh, what producer's hot right now? Get them in with that, and it just becomes this sort of cookie cutter approach that you know they're just really searching for like a mainstream type hit. Um, and I knew Dicky wasn't that type of artist, so I felt like it would be a losing situation for him to to enter into something like that. So you know, we just came up with the idea. Of, let's do it ourselves. You know, up until that point, as a manager, even with Tyga, he was signed to cash money, um, which is part of, you know, universal. And there's a lot of obstacles, uh, in, in terms of politics and red tape and, and dealing with, you know, scheduling and, and, you know, when you're not a superstar artist on a major label, you're not getting the attention that you probably need to develop. And so we, you know, we were just releasing records on our own basically and, and putting things out there and putting out mixtapes, even though he was signed to a major label, we were putting things out independently. And through that, I built a whole network and a team of essentially label services people. You know, I, I had a radio promo person. I had a video promo person. I had PR. I had, you know, digital marketing, like all these different separate pieces that I would pay as like third party vendors. And, and we would just kind of keep it in house and pay out of our own pocket to just get things going. But now I had this whole network. So with Little Dicky, I was like, basically, I'm running an independent label anyway, right now, like unofficially. So maybe it makes sense to actually start a label. And that became the focus. And, 
you know, again, like I said, with management, there's no real security. You don't really own anything. You know what I mean? You're just kind of like a, a hired gun. Um, whereas the label idea, you know, that whole model, like you're, you're building assets, you, you own masters, you, you know, there's something, there's something that you tangibly have and, and it's something you own as a company. And, and it, it started to make a lot more sense just in terms of where I was in a headspace. And so went out, got a, a distribution deal and released my first record, which was Little Dickie's first single, which ended up being way more successful than people thought it would be. <laughs> you know, uh, for, for a guy, you know, a young Jewish white kid, comedian, rapper, you know, like that just looked like your average guy working at an ad agency. People were like, this is never going to work as a rapper. Like, this is not, this is never going to work. And we ended up having a top 10 urban single on, on, on radio, you know, and that, that opened people's eyes. And then we put out his album and the album ended up being the number one rap album, the number one digital album, the number one comedy album, the number one independent album. And, you know, that was sort of like, okay, now I'm a real label. <laughs> and, and from that point, everything shifted where I became focused on signing other artists and building up the label and, and, and actually growing the roster and doing all those sort of things. And, and that was like the main pivot in my career at that point where, you know, I totally transitioned out of management into being a, you know, a label founder and owner and, and built that up over a few years where we ended up being ranked in the top 10 of market share for urban labels and, you know, completely independent competing with, you know, the Def Jams of the world and, you know, all these major label backed companies. So it was definitely uh, vindicating and, and gratifying. And, and it's, it's, you know, it's, it's been fun to be able to build something. I, I like to build, you know, I kind of look at it the same way you, you I would look at artists as a manager. All of it's kind of finding something with potential and building it. You know what I mean? Whether it's an artist, whether it's a company, whether it's a business or different ideas, it's all the same, I think, thought process and, and kind of uh, mechanics to a lot of it. And so with the label becoming really successful and, and with streaming starting to, to really dominate the business and, and make it profitable again, uh, I ended up having an opportunity last year to sell... Uh, a, a large piece of my company. So I sold that to some investors and, and still am growing it, but you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's now a much bigger sort of idea where it's not only my little baby anymore. It's, you know, we have uh, a lot of other things going on and yeah, that sort of brought me here. So then you made the transition over to royalty exchange, which kind of extends the idea of what you're talking about with assets. Well, so, so, you know, what I started to see on the label side is as the, as the landscape started to change, ownership became a much more important priority for, for artists. They wanted to own their own masters. Everyone, you know, sort of wants to be their own entrepreneur, but the, the sticking point always was money. You know what I mean? That's, that's the thing. Like artists to get done sort of the things that they, they, they want to do, they need, they need financing. And, and oftentimes, the only way to get financing is signing, you know, some a deal to some big company who's going to give you a big advance, but then you're tied into them and they own everything. And it's sort of, you know, like it, it kind of, it's the system is almost built for artists to be indebted to these major companies forever. You know I mean? That's, that's what the music business essentially is built on. Um, and then, you know, throughout my career, I've always fought for the independence of artists, whether it was as a manager or even as an owner of an independent label. We did very artist friendly deals. We did licensing deals, you know, things, things like that, that were much more flexible and not, you know, always like this major label model. And so with royalty exchange, it just, you know, made a lot of sense for, I think the future of where the business is going, you know, they have a, a platform that was, it seemed potentially so disruptive in a good way that, you know, I was like, this is amazing. Like, how come people don't know about this? You know, so, so I immediately wanted to figure out a way to get involved with them because I thought, you know, this is, this is the future of the music business. But there's a key to royalty exchange and that's the investors because artists, I would think would be no problem. They would see what you're talking about very easily. And of course, money is king. So they'd rather have the cash now rather than think about the royalties later. But None of that happens until you get the investors. So that's the key. How does that happen? So normally, uh, you know, obviously music 
uh, catalog deals and music royalties and streaming has made it you know, valuable where a lot of investors are trying to get into this space. But traditionally, how it would, would, would work is more of a closed system where, you know, like your lawyer would know maybe a guy from the catalog, you know, a company that buys catalogs and stuff that he would talk to that, you know, it's a very one-on-one backroom type of deal uh, where if you don't have those contacts, you're, you're kind of left out in the cold. Or, you know, if you're not an A-list artist, again, it's, al- it's always like the top 1% of the business that, you know, hypnosis is giving all these big advances to Beyonce and Jay-Z. It's like, of course, because that's, you know, they're Beyonce and Jay-Z, you know, but what about the 99% of other creatives out there that aren't getting these huge deals? Um, and so what Royalty Exchange does differently is, A, it's a platform that's just connecting investors with artists. And it's, it's sort of like an open system. Like anyone could sign up, create an account, join. You could be, what you know, whether you're trying to get financing or whether you're an investor looking to invest. So that alone, you know, sort of just creates this transparency. But then on top of it, we're the largest network of investors for music in the world. It's over 27,000 investors in the system that are looking to invest in music royalties. So, wow. you know, where, where normally you'd have your lawyer, maybe have one or two or three people that are going to potentially buy your catalog. But also with that, they're looking to get the best deal possible. They're looking to pay you as, as little money as possible to get the asset where you're looking to obviously get the most where, you know, on royalty exchange, the whole aspect of competition and transparency you're going to get the highest value no matter what. The market is going to dictate it. It's not going to be some valuation that might be confusing and you don't have you know, other outside opinions on it. This is literally 20,000 plus investors all competing to get you, know, you the best price essentially that you're going to get anywhere else. So that, that alone sets it apart from everyone. Are you talking like an auction? Yeah, it's, a, it's an auction process. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That being said, is there any vetting of artists and investors? There's definitely, uh, it has to be worth, your catalog has to be worth something. You can't just be like, oh, I have a couple songs. Let me try and see if I could get $20 off this. Like, you know, like there's, there's a vetting process in a sense of, you know, if, if there's a, if someone signs up and, and there's just no value there, or it's just not worth it even for them to do it. They, you know, they would be contacted and kind of, you know, walk through the reasons why, but you know, for the most part, the only people that are are going on there, they, they they are active creative songwriters that have you know some kind of credits. And we have a tool on the website called the Know Your Worth tool, where it'll give you a ballpark idea of of what your catalog would be valued at immediately. So you could just go on the website, input some of your your data, and then it'll it'll show you a number. And if you think that number is worthwhile and you want to get into it deeper and, and find out more okay, now you go through the process, but it'll, it'll give you an idea immediately. And at, if at that point, the number you see you like, you could actually say, yes, I, I want to sell this and get an offer immediately and get paid, you know, within days. That's brilliant. Yeah. So, you know, it, it's built for more of the, you know, the middle class musician where, you know, we, we've done some huge deals, with, you know, superstar deals. We've done Eminem's catalog. We've done stuff for Slipknot. We've done, you know, there's, there's been some huge artists, but, I think the real kind of bread and butter of, of the system will be this middle class of musicians who aren't getting the huge pub deals, who aren't getting all, you know, like the, the crazy offers because they're not the, the superstars, but they have solid catalogs. They're making decent money. And this is a way to get them a lump sum that they could actually use to, you know, whether they want to buy a house, they want to invest in something, you know, something like that, where if you're making a decent living, but it's not enough to, to really do something you need to do and you need the financing for it, you could use your assets now to get that money to give you that, that financial flexibility. You know, and, and another thing that sets royalty exchange apart is we're not looking to own your masters. So, so it's really just tapping into a royalty stream for a certain period of time and then you get that back. Uh, whereas you know, these other catalog deals, basically they're buying your, you know, they're buying your creative ideas and owning them. We're not looking to do that. You know, we're just looking to, we have investors that are looking for different ways to diversify their portfolios. They're, you know, from just some wealthy dentist in Ohio to like the pension fund of Korea. You know what I mean? Like from all ends of the spectrum, they're just people that 
you know, they have their, they have money in the markets. They're looking to diversify that music royalties have become a pretty stable asset that you could predict, you know, into the future now. So it's become much more appealing for people that want to get into different areas. So, you know, these aren't people that are looking to buy catalogs and do anything with them or tell you how to, you know, run your creative life or all that. They're, they're literally just looking for a certain yield and music can give that to them. So they just want to passively be investors in, in these new assets. What, what's the term, the normal term? The standard, well, you know, the, the most common term that we have is 30 years, but we've done 10 years, you know, we've done different, uh, a little short, a little longer, depending on the flexibility of, you know, what the artist really wants or what the creative wants. But, you know, normally it's either 10 or 30 years or, you know, life or price. It, it depends how much money, you, you know, you actually want. Obviously the longer, you know, the longer the term, the more money it's going to be. But, you know, if, if getting the reversion, quicker is more important to you, you could still get a decent amount of money and then you get it back. And, you know, there's always a way, our deals are, have a built-in way for artists to buy, essentially buy out of their, you know, pay a penalty to take out the, the, the asset before the term is over. So, you know, if you did do a deal with royalty exchange and then five years from now, you know, someone offers you some insane amount of money that's like a hundred time multiple that, you know, like you just can't pass up this deal. Okay, you know, you're not locked into real exchange either. You just pay, basically pay a penalty fee to take your money out early and you know, you could be on your way. How does royalty exchange monetize this? What do you mean? Do you take a percentage of the deal? Yeah, it's, it's, it's basically we're the platform providing the connection between investors and artists. And we just take an admin fee off that. So, you know, we don't, you know, it's, it's, it's in our actual best interest to make sure the artist gets paid the most <laughs> as possible because then that, you know, means more money for us. And so it's, we're, we're aligned with the artist's interest as opposed to normal companies that would facilitate this where they're aligned with the buyer's interest. Mm, yeah. Got it. Got it. How has COVID changed anything in this part of the business? Well, I mean, COVID interesting, you know, like it's, it, it would affect it how you would think. I mean, you know, streaming as far as like traditional music business, streaming, all that stuff is, is, doing fine. Like it's, it's actually been on the rise because people are home and consuming more content where it's changed is artists aren't able to tour. Obviously right now they're not, you know, all the, all the extra money that they'd be getting from different other verticals in their business are sort of dried up at the moment. So, you know, royalty exchange is offering a way to, to, to be able to get you some financing. If, if you're having trouble paying your bills right now, cause you're not able to tour, you know, things like that. We've actually seen an uptick in, just activity because, you know, I don't know if it's because of COVID or not, you know, it's, we've been growing year after year anyway, but there's definitely a higher interest from creatives now to at least explore th this option as, as a way to, to make some money, you know, because this is a way to make money where a lot of the other avenues are, are not, you know, around right now. If we look at the big picture of music business for a second, let's just take COVID out of it because it's changed so much, but nonetheless, things are always changing and evolving in the music business. Where do you see it going? Overall, I see independent artists rising, you know, the, the rise of independent artists, you know, where they're able to compete with major labels a lot easier than they have been in the past. Um, you know, I think just different ways of distribution, digital landscape, all that has sort of taken down some of the, the, the prior like gates that would, hinder an artist from being able to do things on their own. So I think, you know, we're seeing that in general, that independent artists are, are making more money. They're doing better without, you know, some huge label behind them. I think, you know, the virtual world is going to be a huge space for the future where, you know, we're seeing obviously with like Fortnite and Travis Scott or Marshmallow, you know, doing a concert in Fortnite. I think that's going to become much more the norm than ever before where you know, kids, I have two kids, you know, my youngest son is 10 years old and he, he plays Fortnite. And, you know, to them, watching a concert on Fortnite with virtual artists is completely normal and buying virtual items, skins, using money to buy virtual currency to buy things like that's normal. So I think the future and even with COVID, I think this is uh, accelerating the, you know, the ideas in this landscape where you know, virtual performances, virtual 
merch virtual artists are going to become much more the norm, um, especially as we get into like augmented reality becoming more mainstream where, you know, the Google glasses or the Apple glasses are going to, you know, when they launch in the next year or two, that's going to make it a little more mainstream. And then over the next few years, you're going to see that more and more where you're just looking at something and then, you know, your favorite artist could play a concert in front of you maybe. And, you know, you just pay a smaller fee for that, or you could buy a digital t-shirt of the artist and redeem it for a physical product. I think that's, that's going to be a lot more prevalent over the next few years than ever before, because technology is, is there. You know, you mentioned your son who's 10 years old and is very comfortable in the virtual realm. How do you see that playing out when he's 30? I think, Honestly, you know, like you could go down a whole rabbit hole with this where I think there's going to be everyone, I think everyone is going to have a virtual aspect of their life that's going to blend, you know, even right now, like you look at social media. I mean, Instagram is essentially a virtual version of your life. Like, you know what I mean? Like you're putting out only the best versions, you know, like your coolest picture or, you know, these, you know, in front of, whatever car and this, you know, like it's sort of a fake exaggerated version of a lot of people's lives or, or it's giving you a sense of just the best parts that people want to show you. So, so in a way, you know, psychologically it's no different. You know what I mean? Like I think, uh, from a, from like having a virtual, you know, aspect to your life again with augmented reality becoming more mainstream, it's going to be easier to, 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 to have this, you know, like this virtual alter ego in a way. I think people are going to have like their like avatar and they'll be able to buy goods and, you know, it, it'll be the same as physical goods, except they're going to be digital. And it'll like, you know, you, again, you look at skins on Fortnite, uh, you know, these kids now, they, they, they'll buy whatever skin, the hot new skin is, it gets sold out. You can't buy it anymore. And then there's a, there's a secondary market now for, these skins that are sold out from like earlier seasons of Fortnite that people are paying 10 times what it originally was sold for. And you know, these other kids are reselling it to them. So it, it's working exactly like the physical world, just that, you know, older people that haven't experienced this yet, we don't really grasp it as much, but to, to these younger kids, by the time they're 30, it's going to be completely normal. You know, like they'll have, uh, you know, I think there's going to be virtual real estate. I think there's going to be virtual, you know, clothing that you could take a a picture with your phone and you see it only on the phone. You could post that on social media, but it doesn't exist in real life. It's just going to be, I think, completely normal and and blur the lines where no one's really going to know the difference, you know, 30 years from now. What's your take on the TikTok situation? I think it's to the point where TikTok is almost too big to to fail in a way. You know, I think there's, there's going to be some regulations probably, you know, coming down and, and put on them. Uh, you know, obviously we see things like the, the Microsoft deal and, and trying to do stuff like that, but I don't think you could totally eliminate TikTok um, just because it's, you know, it's reached such a saturation point that, you know, people aren't going to delete it off their phones. You know, like you could shut it down, but then it's, it sort of becomes like, okay, are you taking our freedom? You know, it becomes like a whole other issue. You know, all these social media platforms go through cycles. TikTok is super hot right now. It won't be the hottest forever. Um, I think Triller is making a big dent in TikTok's market. You know, Triller always was, I mean, it's kind of the same platform, but like Triller was just less known where now they're getting a ton of press because of the TikTok stuff and they've been the number one app for whatever past couple months. So I think, uh, you know, that'll, that'll put a dent in it and they'll just be, competing. And then also Instagram launched their reels capability, which is essentially like TikTok on Instagram. So, you know, I don't know. I I don't think the TikTok thing is going to be that big of a deal, you know, moving forward in the next year or two. Like I think, you know, people are right now, everyone's heightened on high alert and there's like paranoia about everything. Um, But they're not going to be able to shut down TikTok. Like there'll, there'll be some changes and maybe because of those changes, other apps or platforms will, you know, rise and get gain some more dominance over it. But I don't think TikTok's going to, you know, really go anywhere. And especially, you know, again, it's been such a, it's it's such a platform to promote artists for our industry. You know, like all these labels are looking for the next TikTok star. Or, you know, you're, or there's whole campaigns to pay TikTok influencers to help you break your music. So, you know, it would 
if TikTok went away, it would it would definitely hurt the music business. And you know, as far as from a marketing standpoint, I think a lot of these digital marketers that put so much onus on that now wouldn't know what the fuck to do. It'd be like, ah, oh, now we got to think of a new strategy. So it's probably good for VPN developers. Yeah, exactly. Last question, Anthony. Thank you so much for your time. This has been great. Yeah, no worries. Thank you. What's the best piece of business advice that maybe somebody imparted to you or maybe you learned along the way? I mean, really, the, the sort of the, the mantra I live by is uh, ask for forgiveness, not permission. <laughs> and uh, I think uh, there was a lawyer that I had once that told me that. And even I know it's been a saying that's been around forever, but like I had a lawyer that mentioned that once to me because that's sort of how I, I've operated a lot of the time. And it, it, then it, it kind of clicked and I'm like, yeah, that, that's been my guiding principle for, <laughs> you know, and, and sometimes it rubs people the wrong way. And, you know, it, it may not always be, uh, you know, the cleanest way to do things, but it definitely, uh, it does, it does help get things done. I, I see, you know, a lot of times people, you find a lot of people that are looking for ways to not make deals happen. And I was like trying to find a way to make the deal happen. And so, you know, you could overthink, you could, you know, talk yourself out of shit. You could worry about like, like oh, so-and-so is going to get mad if I do this. Or do it. But at the end of the day, if you're making progress and it's, you know, for the overall good of the artist or whatever you're trying to do, uh, I think people, people are easy to forgive if they know it's for the right reasons. And so, you know, usually if you ask somebody if you could do something, they're going to say no because, you know, they don't want you to do it. <laughs> like, like if you're asking someone who's, uh, superior to you or, or at a higher stature to you. And, and, you know, you're trying to make your way up, whether you're managing an artist, you have someone you're trying to gain opportunity for them. You know, people are going to say no, because they don't want you infringing on their territory. But if you do it and it works and it's for the right reasons, no one's going to be mad at you about it. Like they, they see like, you know what, I would have did the same thing, you know? So that, that's been sort of a, a great, uh, you know, mantra that has helped guide me through, through most of my career. You can find out more about Anthony and Royalty Exchange at royaltyexchange.com. That's royaltyexchange, all one word, dot com. Thanks for listening and being in my inner circle. Remember, if you have any questions or comments, you can send them to questions at bobbyoinnercircle.com. To listen to other episodes of Bobby Osinski's Inner Circle, go to bobbyosinski.com and select the podcast tab, or go to bobbyoinnercircle.com, or you can find it on iTunes, Stitcher, Mixcloud, Google Play, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Deezer, TuneIn Radio, Radio Public, and Podbean. At BobbyOsinski.com and BobbyOwnerCircle.com, you'll also find a sign-in form for my newsletter and for alerts for new podcasts. This is Bobby Osinski. I will see you next time. Bye.